The world's top trade court, the WTO appellate body, has been rendered ineffective after the U.S. campaign to block the appointment of new judges. Last week, Canada and the EU tried to come up with their solutions, agreed on an interim alternative to stop their trade disputes from falling into limbo. Could the Canada-EU interim alternative work? That is the question. But first, take a look at this. U.S. President Donald Trump opened another chapter in a trade war with China, but this time it's crosshairs also on the WTO. Last Friday, the U.S. put pressure on the WTO to change how it designates developing countries. Mr. Trump sought to redefine the status of developing countries. On Tuesday, China fired back the classification of a developing nation shouldn't be defined by the interests of the U.S. WTO is not owned or dominated by one or a few countries, but you respect the common will of all members. Coming on the eve of a new round of U.S.-China trade talks, the move many believe appears aimed at pressuring Beijing to commit to more purchases of American goods. Besides China, Mr. Trump went after the WTO seven-member appellate body. The U.S. has rendered the world's top trade court practically ineffective. As Trump blocked nominations of new judges, the court will be unable to hear appeals in trade disputes after December this year. Several WTO members have tabled proposals. Recently, Canada and the EU agreed to a new trade dispute resolution system as a temporary substitute to the WTO's appellate body. Such agreement is widely seen as vital to tackling trade protectionism. After this summit, we're closer to finalizing an agreement, which would help preserve the function of an appeal system within the WTO until we find a more permanent solution. Could the interim appeals body succeed where the WTO appellate court has stumbled? Would the idea catch on? So could Canada-EU interim alternative to the WTO appellate court work? To what extent will it work? Let's look in our panelists. In Toronto, Canada, we have Oral Brown, a professor of international relations and political science at the University of Toronto. In London, we invited Ian Beck, a professor at the European Institute and co-director of the Darendor Forum, London School of Economics and Political Science. In Beijing, Liu Baocheng from the University of International Business and Economics. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Professor Brown, go to you first. How long do the Canadians believe this alternative would work? Well, certainly there's hope that it would work, but I think this hope may be exaggerated. This is something temporary, and it does not apply to relations between the United States and Canada. Mm. This solution would be something that would be applicable to relations between the EU and Canada. The EU certainly is a very major trading partner of Canada. It is important in investments, but it pales in comparison with the United States. United States is by far the largest trading partner and investor in Canada, and consequently, it's not going to resolve the kind of issues that we have over softwood lumber yeah. and other problems uh, between Canada and the U.S. So here is the thing, Professor Bagg, you know it very well. WTO appellate body seven members. Now you only have three members left in the body, and two of the three, their term will expire in December, which means you only have one person left in the appellate body. Of course, it's going to be irrelevant beginning from next year. U.S. refused to come to any conclusion of confirming any future judges. Now, Professor Bagg, what can we do? Is Canada EU way the best way? Well, I think you need to, to take one step back first and okay. point out that arbitration is a necessary feature of a rules-based system. If you can't arbitrate and make, make uh, appeals and judgments at the end of it, then the system as a whole is, 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 is weakened. And that was precisely the reason that the, the w, World Trade Organization was set up with this new judicialized body, the appellate, uh, appellate body d designed to make a final decision on disputes. 
Now, what the Canadians and the Europeans have done is to suggest an alternative way of doing this, which applies only to the two of them. There are 160 other members of the World Trade Organization, and they are not going to be subject to this new initiative. It may pave the way for a different approach to settling appeals, but only if you can get the other major players, particularly China and the U.S., to sign up to it, and we're a long way from that. Mm -hmm. Professor Liu, now, we all understand WTO, the reason why it's called World Trade Organization and this rule is different from the earlier body called the GATT is because WTO has the T's. The T's is exactly referring to the appellate body which is going to deal with disputes as mentioned by the earlier two professors. Now, Professor Liu, it does not anymore given the current circumstances. Will other countries follow suit to try to establish bilateral deals like what Canada and EU have been doing this time with the interim alternative? Or are there are other ways they can try to figure out some solutions. At least trade disputes has to be resolved, even next year. Yeah, that's the, uh, the strength of uh, WTO to have the DSP or dispute settlement body in place to adjudicate uh, cases when uh, there's a disagreement. And uh, so right now, when it's, uh, the uh, appellate court is being jeopardized with the U.S. Uh, uh, blockade, mm -hmm. so there can be uh, certain solutions. One is, of course, you know, Canada and EU actually raised a very symbolic uh, gesture. So, okay, so we still follow WTO rules and uh, we, we do it on a, a bilateral basis mm -hmm. or a trilateral basis. So uh, that can really serve uh, as one option. I think even if, you know, uh, when WTO is really normalized because there is still a high level of backlog uh, in place. So therefore that can be a a solution, and the other is okay. You know, if the U.S. continues or permanently with, uh, you know, uh, hold on uh, the decision to nominate the judges, can uh, WTO secretariat and call on the uh, WTO other members and say, okay, let's elect some other uh, the uh, juries on, onto the board. I see. And uh, the other is okay. The if the DSP, uh, you know, uh, decide, okay, we can really delegate to certain, uh, uh, you know, well-known arbitration bodies uh, that are available, uh, in, in, uh, you know, around the world. Very interesting. So that can also be uh, one alternative. A lot of intellectual approach, I would say, uh, Professor Brown, but the question is, does the world, without the United States, be able to function? Uh, that is the question I would like to ask you, especially when it comes to trade. And also, will others have the confidence and the guts to do so? Well, of course, this is the fundamental question. Can you build something? Can you have some kind of arbitration mechanism without the United States? And there are, in some quarters, the assumption that this is a problem that pertains particularly to the Trump administration, which has challenged many of the institutions in the international system. But the reality is that the United States as a whole has been unhappy about some of the proceedings for quite some time now. Let us not forget that, let's say in the case of one of the judges, uh, uh, Jennifer Hillman, she was blocked from reappointment not by the Trump administration but by the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. And there's no assurance that, let's say, if Mr. Trump loses the election, uh, a new government of the United States would take a necessarily dramatically different approach. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, there are these very basic structural questions and procedural questions that need to be addressed because when you have a superpower like the United States that has been unhappy and opposed to how decisions were made for quite some time now, okay. then whether we like it or not, we have to address those issues. Professor Liu, now when it comes to the United States, uh, the U.S. administration this time have been asking whether the developing country status of both China and some of the others should be scrapped off. And as a result of that, the overall change the picture of the WTO situation. Uh, Professor Liu, of course China is against that, but the question really is what's next, right? When you have strong economies in the world, emerging economies that are really not in line with the largest economy in the world, uh, are we going to see more and more battlegrounds within the WTO framework, Professor? 
definitely it's inevitable. Uh, the U.S. is really trying to unravel the entire table and set up new rules, uh, but uh, they forget the fact that, uh, you know, there are uh, over 160 uh, members and the, uh, the, the, the whole essence of WTO or the spirit of WTO is really inclusiveness and uh, major decisions are really based on consensus. So otherwise it's the U.S. club, you know, everyone has, uh, else has to rejoin. So therefore, uh, there, uh, that, you know, with this type of attitude and also with not, uh, the gestures such as like, uh, you know, uh, blocking the jewelry, etc. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, definitely they're going to offend many other members. So the uh, and plus that two third of the uh, countries within the WTO framework are really, uh, by definition, developing countries. Right. So you know, if you totally ignore this fact, then you know uh, it's going to be impasse, and uh, other members will have to find an alternative way of getting engaged. When you talk about other members, certain members certainly these are very interesting alternatives that they are trying to figure out. But on the other hand, Professor Begg, if you think in the shoes of the Trump administration, which could be a little bit challenging for you, but anyway, uh, on the one hand, they could say, okay, WTO has become irrelevant, so let's not to deal with it. On the other hand, it could force uh, some of the other countries, whether emerging or developing economies or some of the other trading partners of the United States for decades, to do something that they do not like in the names of protecting WTO. So for the Trump administration, there seems to be no lose game anyway. Yes, and I think that's the way the administration sees it, as they want to recast the rules of the global trading system to be much more in favor of the United States. It's also perhaps significant that if you look at the increase in the number of disputes that's going on, I've, I've checked the WTO website on this, you see that far more of the current disputes do concern the United States. Mm -hmm. So they, they need for themselves ultimately to have a system that enables them to settle disputes. Otherwise, they're going to find their own difficulties in, in some of the things they're trying to do. But what, what's but been very clear is that the But they can just walk away from the disputes the and say, I'm not going to be responsible for any of the things that you have been raised against me. Yes, they can, but then they want to export as well. And if, if they're blocked That's in true. exporting, there are one or two big American companies that are going to be terribly upset with this, with names like Boeing and Microsoft. Mm -hmm. They will want to ensure that there is a, a system in place that they can deal with successfully. Mm -hmm. So maybe there is a, a need for a, an overall recasting of the approach to governing world trade. But that has to include some revised form of dispute settlement. I see. Professor Brown, so what is the solution um, after a long discussion, to you at least? Well, it has to be through some kind of cooperation. Yes, United States does have an interest. It's a very large trading nation, but it is not quite as dependent on trade as some other countries are. And uh, uh, I think there has been a good deal of unhappiness in the United States. There are issues elsewhere as well. So I think uh, a cooperative approach would help. But what is happening right now may not be necessarily the best way. One might argue that it is just that Canada and the EU would try something mm. uh, different, an alternative, uh, something temporary. But if this uh, creates more friction between the United States and Canada, that will not necessarily be helpful. So there's a difference between that which may be just and that which may be wise strategically. Right. Before we go, I also want to ask the other two gentlemen very briefly, if you can. There seems to be two issues. One is your national interest, which, of course, also has something to do with the international rules. But on the other hand, there's a bigger thing, which is about how the international system should be running. Would there be one veto coming from the U.S., the others have to say, okay, well, we could just do whatever you want. So, Professor Beck, here's a very interesting question, isn't it? Briefly from you, sir. Well, yes, the, the Americans have shown in the last couple of years especially that they're prepared to be the, the big kid in the playground, bullying the other kids. And I think that the danger with that is that then the other kids start to gang up against the United States in a way which becomes counterproductive for everybody. 
we shouldn't forget the 1930s when these kinds of trade wars led to all kinds of negative consequences, not just for the, tr the economy, but uh, mm. what with wider political ramifications. So let's, let's remember history in this and say, let's find a way through this. And well. that's what I've been trying to... Uh, trying to put forward in some ideas I've been publishing. Well, you want to find a way. Will others also want to find a way? Or the other want to find a way? Professor Liu, briefly. Well, uh, I think uh, the U.S. is really trying to, uh, say, bully the rest of the uh, other countries while they still maintain a uh, stress in, uh, in military, uh, in finance, and also in trade, etc. But this gesture will mean that, uh, you know, they will lose more of the collective restructure and also the support from other neighbors and the rest I of see. the uh, W2 members. So this is really self jeopardizing So this can also push more for the rest of the global community to rally together for their own solution. Very interesting. Certainly the three of you have different solutions, different concerns, but absolutely this discussion is going to continue. Liu Bao Chang, Ian Beck, uh, Laurel uh, Brown. Thank you so much, uh, the three gentlemen.